yo, what's up, Devin? How you doing? Hey, Raj. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing good today, man. We have one of my favorite artists, and I'm not just saying this because she's on the show today, but really, I'm a fan of all of her music and everything she does. Miss Holly Cook is on the show today. Yay! So we're going to be able man, to... Man, we've been, you know, we were just talking about this uh, in our little sound check before the show, that we've been trying to get this episode to happen, or like at least talking about making this episode happen right. almost since the beginning of the pod clash. So uh, it's like a little pod clash bucket list check right here. Yes, it definitely is, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally sealed the deal. But um, before we jump into that, you know we got to play some records, right? Got to play some records. So um, uh, you want me to go first this, this week? Yeah, I, I like when you go first. I like when I go first, too, because... I get really excited, and I am excited again for this one. Um, you know what? Let's just play it. I'll say it's from Mountain Ellis, and the song's called Lord Deliver Us, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Boom. There we go. We're back. I don't know how that. Lord deliver us by Mr. Elton Ellis, man. Um, I want to play that record just because it's cool that it got scratched out. The name got scratched out. Um, for those on your copy, on my copy, and uh, a quick little explanation of that. Um, if you ever get a Jamaican record and the name is scratched out, I wonder if they do this in other genres too. But a lot of the the reasoning behind that is these DJs would play these records and scratch out the name of the artist and the song on purpose because they wouldn't want anybody to go and cop their vibe, go and steal their, you know, go grab that record and play it in their dance hall or play it um, in competing uh, places, you know. Like certain dance halls wanted their, you know, dance hall to be playing the hits and whatever was in 
Oh, for so, sure. Um, like your your sound system, your sound wanted, you know, you didn't want to be playing records other people were playing because that way people were coming to your dance to hear that, you know, they knew that you were the only one that had that tune. Right, right, exactly. A um, couple of little facts about Mr. Alton Ellis. Devin and myself got to back Mr. Ellis. Uh, how long ago was that? It was 2006. So 2006. Man. That was, wow, man. It's, it doesn't seem like that ago. long ago. 15 Jeez. years ago. It's actually 15 years ago, like this June. So No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was such a trip because um, obviously me and Devin are huge fans. We're huge fans of Alton Ellis. And for him to, to come and uh, even rehearsals were just its own reward, you know, rehearsing with him. I, I know we've told this story before, but at the end of the first rehearsal, we asked him if he wanted to do a second rehearsal because there was a few days for the show. And he was like, yeah, if you guys want to rehearse for sure. So the next day or whatever it was, we came back and we were all there waiting for him. And he showed up with... A 12-pack of Corona and right. a large pizza for right. the band. He just brought it. And I was like, this is... I had to, like, soak it in for... I was like, this is a super surreal, like, existential moment in my life that Alton Ellis just brought me a pizza and a 12-pack of Corona. How crazy and, was yeah, that? I, I don't think... I, I will never forget that. I remember that more than the show or even right. the rehearsals. Like, I just remember that moment. Right. I remember... Um, being super stoked and then being super like deer in the headlights when he we started the set off and it was going to start with just me on piano and him walking right. out i was very very <laughs> nervous the song was called the song is called willow tree and it just it was like he's like, all right man you're gonna give me the note and you're gonna accompany me as i walk out and i was like oh man you know uh as an aside, Willow Tree is the was the song that uh, Vanessa and I walked down the aisle to. Really? Yeah. Wow. Obviously, long after uh, after that show, but I remember you being very nervous about that. You're saying like, dude, as soon as you, you told me like, look look over at me right when the band starts, because <laughs> right. Roger was just doing like this little piano thing by himself mm -hmm. and out and walked out, out on stage and was singing a little bit and then as soon as he got to the like no no more that's when the the band kind of bum, jing, bum, jing, jing. he was yeah. roger was like dude look at me right when that happens i'm gonna be so stoked if i if i didn't mess up the intro and so he did stoked. not mess up the intro it sounded great yeah and the show went great and out Ellis had a voice like he did day one his voice was so strong and uh that was the first time we met and christopher i think he brought christopher over and yeah, it was a great pictures. time um, but th this song, Lord Deliver Us, was released in 1971 by Mr. Lloyd, the Matador Daily. The Matador. Um, and yeah, man, it's just one of those songs that has a really nice bounce to it. Uh, the organ is really doing some cool stabs, kind of playing in the pockets, uh, you know, talking where he should be talking, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it could get busy. There are several versions of that song and that all were recorded, I think, around the same time, if not mm -hmm. like at exactly the same time, because they they sound really, really similar, but like right. with different lyrics. And the version that I heard first, um, you know, early in my reggae listening days was uh, was called Back to Africa. Mm. And um, it's got different lyrics. And they're speaking of organ, there are like, you know, after the still can help us, still right. can help us. The organ would go into these free boom, -da 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 -da, these what? really cool lines. I'll, I'll send it to you. It's a really, really cool version, and I don't hear it that yeah. much. I usually hear this version or another one. There's right. three that I know, but the, I just always think of that version because it was the first one I heard. And you know, mm -hmm. for years I thought I didn't realize there were other versions. You know, so oh, I'll send dude. you that one. It's really cool. It's really send cool. Send it on over. I will. Um, what, what do you got for us? That this was a great week? tune today. My record is by one of my favorite artists of all time, the late great, speaking of artists that we backed, the late great Leonard Dillon of the Ethiopians. Yeah. We'll talk about this on the flip side, but I want everyone who maybe, you know, doesn't really have the easiest time understanding Jamaican Patois, I want to give a little backstory of the story, uh, of what he's talking about in this record. The song is called Weekend Cowhead, and it's about a girl that he knows, Liza, who has the job of going to the market to buy the weekend cow head. You know, it's like, it's the weekend, we're going to really get fancy and, and go cook a cow head. So she goes and gets the cow head and brings it back to the yard. But she made a mistake, which was that before she went, she never like went, we, before she went to buy the cow head, she never mm -hmm. went and gathered enough firewood to cook it. So mm. she brought the cow head back and was like, oh man, I forgot to get the wood. So she went to go get the wood. While she was doing that, she took too long and the cow head went bad and started to smell. And now everyone in the yard is really mad at Liza. And, wow. you know, on the flip side, we'll talk about whether or not Liza got a raw, a raw deal here. <laughs> if this really was <laughs> Liza's fault. But in any case, this is Weekend Cow Head by the great Leonard Dillon, backed by Soul Syndicate. Why, why, what that you do? Why, why, lies 
Lisa come out Why, why, what that you do? Liza go a market, go by weekend, go ahead Carry it home, free boil in a bell a goat Everybody die, yeah, the wait I wait for them weekend, go ahead But one mistake, them never look no good The cat in fire, free boil in bell a goat One mistake, she never look the wood We get the fire, we boil the bell a goat Before we we'll look Coward smell, everybody pull up them head and start to shout. Liza come out. Why, why, what that you do? Why, why, Liza come out? Liza go a market, go by weekend, go ahead Carry it home, fi boil in a bell a goat Everybody die, yeah, the wait I wait for them weekend, go ahead But one mistake, them never look no wood We get the fire, fi boil bell a goat One mistake, she never look the wood We get the fire, fi boil bell a goat Before wood how it smell, everybody pull up them head and start to shout, lies that come out. Why, why, what that you do? Why, why, lies that come out? Why, why, what that you do? Why, why, lies that come out, girl? Why, why, what that you do? Yes, that's Weekend Cowhead by the late, great Leonard Dillon, backed mm. by the Soul Syndicate. This is my copy yes. right here. Jaguar 7-inch from 1974. Wicked. Leonard Dillon with the Soul Syndicate. And you can really, like, that lead guitar, it's got to be Chinna Smith, because it sounds like Chinna Smith and right. the Soul Syndicate, you know? So it could be Tony Chin playing lead guitar, but usually he was doing rhythm. Um, yeah. But, man, that's not, that song is just so wicked. It's another one of those tunes that, like, I didn't find until after Leonard passed, so I never got mm -hmm. to, like, ask him about it. Right. Um, but... Man, I love that song. Me and Butcher from the Expanders, we used to, that was like one of our backstage warm ups. Like it just lends itself really nicely to harmonies. But yeah, Liza messed up the whole cowhead business. She didn't look for the wood. But I play this a lot on my Tuesday acoustics thing. And, um, uh -huh. and one, of, one of the listeners, Rachel, who always is, you know, is, is there almost every Tuesday, big up Rachel. Um, she, I played this song and she was like, she was like, you know, I kind of feel bad for Liza. Like, everyone's mad at her. Why didn't they? They couldn't have helped her. They couldn't have helped her, like, get the wood while she was out getting Scapegoat, the cowhead. man. And I was they like, you know what, her. Rachel, you're absolutely right about that. I never really thought about it. But I you think know, she got a cool? raw deal. All she got out of it was Leonard writing this, this song, chastising her forever, <laughs> you know? Because everyone's mad at her. Like, that's, that's the hook. You know, why, why, Liza, come out. Why, why, what that you do? You know, they're, they're, they're mad at Liza because she made a mistake. It's a one mistake. She never looked no wood when she before she went to get the the cow head so um, i think you need to write a song and how counter, cool would this story be yeah to counter it like a, another story where from liza's perspective you know, yeah because think about all them <laughs> old school right think about some like many countless songs i mean the one that comes to mind i mean they're kind of x-rated versions but you know you'd have your version you'd have your almost borderline it's like sexist where like the dude's talking about the woman but then the 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 female comes out with a version that's kind of doing the opposite to the dude i don't mm -hmm. know if you've, yeah oh yeah for sure there's for sure. examples that i don't know if i want to mention but yeah i know uh, exactly what you're talking about. you know exactly what examples i'm talking about these slackness kind of early slackness tunes but yeah don't, but it'd be cool to do like a you know like a a, a to be continued kind of song where, where you're giving justice to liza you know what i mean like uh, <laughs> yeah. it could be cool like no one help me if yeah, you don't right. do it that i'm a good idea it. no it's a really good idea <laughs> and then I'm you have a backstory it. to it yeah but the cowhead man i think they were they were hangry you know yeah that's what it was and it's a big deal you know what i mean yeah. it's it's the weekend cowhead you gotta wait a whole other week for the weekend cowhead they just started blaming people poor liza poor liza good song though i, I really dig it and as i was hearing that song dude i just realized based on the vocal melody that there's a there's an organ version to that Mm. melody 
Winston Winston Wright has like a version, but trip out on this, it's not on that rhythm. So as I'm hearing mm -hmm. that song, I know of an organ tune where Winston's playing that melody, the but melody not that on the, that the rhythm. The guitar's doing or that the vocals? No, the vocals. vocals. Oh, wow. Right. It, the lead well, guitar's I mean, not even in that. It, it does, you know, I'm not like a musicologist, you know, maybe Joey Altruda would know, but like, it, it strikes me, a lot of Leonard's tunes, mm -hmm. you know, ha, like have a lot of like Mento and Jamaican folk music. Oh, good call. Um, yeah. You know, inspiration in them from mm -hmm. a lyrical standpoint and from, you know, a melodic standpoint. So right. it could be that that melody is really, even if he didn't mean to, it could be very close to some old Calypso or Mento thing, you know. Uh, it's Good very possible, call. you know what I mean? Good and if that's call. the case, then, then yeah, you would hear it other places for sure. I'm not saying that definitely is the case, but, you know, that, that kind of thing tends to happen a lot. No, good call. I got to listen but, to that. But, like, that, that song really, like, among other things, demonstrates Leonard's lyrical genius. He's just one. Right. He's my favorite. He's one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Jamaican artists because of his songwriting. I just right. think, when I think of songwriters from Jamaica that I just hold on a pedestal. I think of Bob Marley and I think of Leonard Dillon and there are some others, but those two are really, you know, the ones where they just every, like, there's no such thing as a bad Bob Marley song. And there's no such thing as a bad Ethiopians or Leonard Dillon song. There just isn't, right. there just aren't, I never heard one. And he just, he, he knows how, he knew how to write a song out of any topic. I call it like keeping your songwriting radar on at all times. You know, mm -hmm. things happen to all of us in everyday life mm -hmm. that, you know, we don't realize like, oh, that's a great topic for a song. You know what I mean? We just let things happen to us all the time. And songs don't have to be like super deep. You know what I mean? It's nice to write like a really, a really deep song, but it's also nice to write a song about being mad at Liza because she didn't gather the wood before she got the cow head. If you write it right, you know what I mean? If you, if, and he, Leonard just had the art of song crafting down, you know, he knew mm -hmm. how to, he knew how to write a lyric that could be direct and poetic at the same time. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? To me, at least, to my well, ear. Melody, like I'm saying, melody. You can you can read. Uh, you can pick up any book, and read the lyrics. And if your melody's dope, then you got a good song right there. You know what I mean? Because I, I think that's what makes a good song. We talk about this all the time on the show. It's like, okay, the content of your lyrics, right? Check if that's dope. Now the melody in which you sing that in, check. Is it a melody? You know. And then of course the music, the composition. For sure. And if he, all three are dope, then you're in a. He checked those boxes because he, totally. he could write vocal melodies, he could write lyrics, and he produced and arranged a lot of his own stuff. Like a lot of I, I've been noticing on a lot of other like seven inches I have from that time, by other groups it'll say produced and or arranged by Leonard Dillon. He did it more than I than I nice. realized that he did. Um, he was definitely like people knew to go to him I, for help with you know just crafting a tune. I was playing going through my forty fives and um, that song Sela. Mm -hmm. By the Ethiopians, it's like I I can never play that live, right? Like if I'm DJing, I can never, you know, because it's a good groove, and, w and you would appreciate it. Yeah, but you can never really like, you know. I'm trying to find okay, how do you yeah. throw it in a set? But the melody in his lyrics are dope, man. You know, he got a lot of songs you can't throw in a DJ set, really. It, right. Unfortunately, no, he's got some that you can for sure. He's got some early like skinhead reggae bangers, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And rock steady like Engine oh, sure. Fifty Four works in a set. You totally he's that, got yeah. he's got a tune from the early like early reggae days called Make You Go On So, mm -hmm. and that Hong one Kong is Flu like, is, is Hong Kong Flu. That's a banger. Um, he's got some, but he's also got a bunch like this that are just really slow. Um, right. And we've talked about this a bunch, and I, you know I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's like I wish don't I beat wish a dead people, cowhead. I don't, I don't want to beat a dead cowhead, but mm -hmm. I wish people were more open in live like dance settings mm -hmm. to music being slow. You know, music doesn't have to be fast all the time, or even most of the time. You know, that's just right. I wish people would be more open minded to slow music. I was really it took me a lot of like bitter. I had a lot of bitter moments as a DJ. You mm -hmm. know. When I first started DJing, I was like, no, like people are going to love this. They just haven't heard it, you know? And I would play tunes like that, right. and it was just like crickets. And I'm like, oh, okay. All okay, right. All right. Mm, I see. I but see anyway, <laughs> that is our Record of the Week yes. segment. And before we bring our guest, Miss Holly Cook, on, I want to remind everybody to please support the show by going to the Reggae Pod Clash merchandise store. This is a nonprofit show. We don't make any money, but we do have some expenses, and it really helps when you pick up some merchandise. And besides helping us, you know, if you're like me and you're just always looking for a new, a new reggae shirt or a new reggae hoodie or a new reggae mug, this is your place. Go to rootfire.net and click on the store tab. We got mugs, we got hats, we got beanies, we got hoodies, we got this nice mid-drift hoodie. Um, my brother's girlfriend rocks that mid-drift hoodie all the time and she loves it. 
So mm -hmm. I recommend people go check that out. And we might have some new designs coming pretty soon. But I don't think these have gotten old yet. I love. I, I wear my hoodie all the time. Where designed they? by Mr. Roger Revis. Oh yeah, we got. Yeah. You know, when I uh, start designing like another edition, right? Like the, the so that people that have these designs can be like, oh, I got the first design. You know what I mean? So we'll. Yeah, it's we'll uh, see. very good. We'll, you know, um, yes. Well, it's time to bring our next guest out. And you know, I have a short story. I was. Um, I think it was in, uh, where was it? Could have been Spain or somewhere where they had like an after party um, after our show and the DJs are playing. There's some really good uh, reggae after parties that go on over there. And the DJ's playing a tune and I was like, what the heck? I've never heard this tune before, right? And they mixed it in so well with like some of the old school music that was going on. And the song was called Mil uh, Milk and Honey. I go to the DJ's booth and I'm like, oh, I'm like who is this? Like, well, it's cracking, you know? Um, and sure enough, he showed me, let me know what was up. And uh, it was just the most amazing voice. It was a beautiful composition. Like it just, I was like, dude, this this song rocks. And then years later, I would find that I would play this song with her on stage. She has an amazing voice. Her swag is cool AF. Please welcome <laughs> to the show, Miss Holly Cook. Yay! Cool. Yes. Hi. Holly, Hello. how you doing? Hello. I'm good, thanks, guys. How are you? Good, good. We're, We're so stoked great. you're on the show. Yes, uh, thank you for coming on. Thanks. thanks so much for having me. It's great to see you. Yeah, Likewise. great seeing you. Um, yeah, I haven't seen you in a bit. I mean, uh, for our listeners out there, I had the fortunate uh, duty of backing Miss Holly Cook on keyboards for two shows. Yeah. Uh, how, when? How many years ago was that? Wow, I don't know. Quite a few. That was it late. was quite a few. At least twenty fifteen. Yes, yes, definitely. We'll like, say twenty fifteen. We'll say twenty fifteen. Yeah. yeah, I went and, to that show. I I wasn't playing, but I, I I rode up and went to that show at Sierra Nevada World Music Festival. And yeah, Roger. We took I took this uh, we took this picture with me Roger it was basically the band I don't know where you were Holly but we took this picture and <laughs> and Roger like photoshopped the Taj Mahal behind it and oh, yeah. and that yeah. that picture has showed up in my life like so many times since then so uh, I have you to thank for that for that picture Holly thank you oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the then best trip ever to the Taj and, Mahal and and Holly's really good friends with with Blake Blake went on a, a run Ooh. with you right. Yeah, 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 a couple at this point, yeah. Yeah, heck yeah. Nice. Um, I, I want to jump in. I kind of want to work backwards because I want to okay. talk about your newest thing that you did with um, with Gentleman's Dub Club, Honey. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that was the newest thing. That, um, I don't know, is it, has it been the newest thing you've done or have you, have you done some stuff after that? Um, no, no, that's like the most recent thing that has been created that is out in the world at the moment. Nice which is really nice. It's how amazing. did how did that whole collab come about with, with the Gentleman's Dope? Um, well, the, the GDC guys have been my friends for mm. a little while now. Um, we are all based in London at this point. They, they were kind of, they formed in Leeds, but they're all mostly London based now. So for the last, like almost 10 years we've been like running into each other um at festivals i've opened for them on a few shows of the, like a few of their london shows over the last like eight years mm. and now uh for the last two years toby the bassist and uh producer for the band who you guys spoke to a couple of weeks ago maybe we did, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um toby shares a studio in london with my drummer and uh, and collaborator ben from general roots nice. um so yeah just more so in the last like well i guess in that we've been getting we've been becoming pretty friendly like hanging out loads in the last like five years and uh I guess it was just it was just time to do to do the thing. They um, were extremely uh, productive during our our lockdown in the original uh, in the original bad times a year ago, mm -hmm. um, and they got together all the songs and they had an idea to bring me in on Honey, seeing as I already have a uh, a connection to the stuff. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but they, they figured that singing about honey some more would probably uh, work well for, for them. <laughs> there, you go. there you uh, go. And I live with Luke from GDC. Who oh, nice. 
the band who also plays in my band who I've been writing some stuff for my album to. So yeah, we were just here. And so I was very kind of present for like in the background for the creation of their record. I could hear all the online Zoom meetings and songwriting sessions going on. So yeah, when it came to it, it was super easy. Me and Luke sat down together and we had one verse to to do. So we like, hung out and uh, and had a beer and and it came out real nice I think it's yeah. really it did nice come out real nice to, uh, to yeah to finally collaborate with with friends I feel like that's not something I've done so much of so it it um, comes but, off to it comes off to me like and many others right because everyone is into Miss Holly Cook's music it that when a song gets promoted and it says like featuring Holly Cook it already it has your attention like you don't even have to listen to it. You just know, like, okay, I, you know, I need to listen to this now. For sure, yeah. And 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 there's there's artists that have that power, and and um, I trip out on that always, right? Because we always tend to do that. Like it's like, oh, just the name alone. I haven't heard this. I have to hear it. Chances are I'm gonna love it. And you you know your record shows it because um, you know all the albums you've come out with are just amazing. I they each have like a different flavor, you know. When yeah. I, when I yeah. they and and I think that um you do a really good job of kind of some artists will, will I don't want to say change the sound, but like as they progress, you know, as the years go on, you know, maybe their fans of the early stuff isn't a fan of their newest stuff, yeah, but for, you yeah, keep this right. ingredient that, that is just, uh, it maintains through all your discography. So. Oh, thanks. I'm really, I'm I, I'm, I'm always kind of prepared and willing to, to, you know, lose, lose people along the way. If, if that's the case, not, not like, <laughs> Fuck you. See you later. Sorry, right. no, no. Oh, you we can, can say, you can. Please, we can, we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's nice because uh, yeah, I do, I do just, as, I just assume that as as an artist develops, it's it's common that you know where you started and where you end up doesn't necessarily bring everyone with you, and that's cool too. Um, but if you say that everyone stayed, I'll believe you. I'm telling you, especially, <laughs> no, especially. Sure. I, yeah. I mean, I think there's like there's there's you know organic evolution of your sound which is like super healthy and, and natural for an artist and then there's like you get the feeling sometimes like artists are kind of like trying to change just for change change's sake you know and i yeah, think that's yeah. where i think that's where people start to lose lose you you know what i mean and and your music doesn't doesn't really do that it, like it, it maintains a very like organic like okay this is this is like this is this is holly cook like doing holly cook you know yeah it, it maintains yeah. that quality I, I always try and be very, very true to where I'm at at that particular moment when I'm creating. So, yeah, glad it, that it seems as as genuine as I as I as I think it is. <laughs> definitely, and, and it crosses over to like, even though you're a modern artist, it, you know, me and Devin are a part of both scenes over here in California, where you have the modern reggae, and mm -hmm. then you know, me and him have grown up in the whole purist scene, where you know, it's the ska rock steady thing, um, early reggae. Yeah. Your music transcends just the a modern reggae artist. It definitely is injected in our scene over here. That's like what we call, you know, whatever the rock steady scene, ska scene yeah. kind of thing. I mean, when you play dub club, you know, all of them came out. And, you know, it's a great scene. It's one of my faves. <laughs> <laughs> It has its moments. <laughs> it has its moments for sure. But yeah, I, I mean, I had to ask. I have to ask you because I know when we were on the road, when we when we drove up to Sierra Nevada, I don't know how the subject of it came up, but like the song Liquidator, right? Harry J. All Stars, that organ tune, Liquidator. You you had said something. I think maybe you and Blake or Dave Wilder were talking in passing. But I wanted to ask you, and I want to see if this had anything to do with your your wonderful father, you know, Paul Cook, who was in the Sex Pistols. Um, growing up. Your reggae, as it, as it, your definition of reggae, was was there? You know, the whole 1969, the whole you know skinhead reggae movement, that whole music was it? Was it injected in there? Did you know about that as you were discovering reggae? Um, yeah, 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 definitely. That's kind of as as far as I can remember. That's kind of almost where it it started, like at at the beginning, quite naturally. Um, through my dad a bit like the funny thing with that is is like you would expect like considering that my dad had a huge connection to reggae throughout his childhood all the way through like his like social and music life as a as a young fun person I didn't really 
get introduced to a lot of reggae from my parents who were both very heavily in the kind of reggae scene in London uh, in the 70s. Um, but Liquid Acer in particular was introduced to me by my dad because that is the entrance song that Chelsea Football Club used. That's right. Um, and as a kid, I used to go to football matches with my dad. So that's where the knowledge of that song came up and then through there kind of like filtered into my musical interests and got a bit got a bit further into it. I met some cool girls when I was at school who were super into like Scar and Rocksteady. So that's kind of more where it came from, where my nice. interest in the, in, the, in, in the music came from eventually in my early teens. Nice. nice. Were there some were there some artists when you were like first getting into it through the people at school? Were there like some some artists that you really gravitated towards? Um Yeah. I mean, we were massively into like the specials and the selector and then like Phyllis Dillon and Alton Ellis and early Dennis Brown, those were and we used to like we used to hang out at Gaz's Rock and Blues, right, when we were Beautiful. Kids, so we just kind of soaked up all the all the vibes that were going on there, which kind of introduced us into a whole into a whole ton of that. Whether or not we knew who who the artists were, we were just kind of just super down and there for for the vibes and the music, you know. So yeah, and um, Gaz's spot. <laughs> were there some like at that time? Were there some like London or, or UK groups doing like music that sounded like that that you guys were into? Um, at that point not really like as there probably were but way back when even though that's the music i was getting into i was still like heavily into like rock and indie at the time so i was for for live music's sake i was probably far more interested in trying to get into like a Deftones gig than I was. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Which, um, you know, ironically, like Deftones always sounded like a ska band name to me. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. You mentioned Gaz's Club. And I, I've been there a couple times and how small that is on Wardour Street. Yeah, it, it's just the so. The Moritz Club is so great. It's like so you, a pure Soho original. Right. You, you must be really good friends with, with Gaz over the years. Have yeah 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 just from like being west london locals as well and like he knew my parent he knows my parents and one of my best friends um zoe zoe devlin was a singer in the trojans for a long time oh nice kind of still is and um over the years i've kind of depped in for her when she's not been around so i've been wow. like I've been on, on the nice. road a tiny bit with the trojans as well so i've got i've you know every, everyone knows Gas in London. Anyway. Right, right, right. I've spent some nice time. With them. <laughs> so, um, you know, now I want to go back now to the early stuff, and I know you probably answered these questions a million times, but for our our listeners, it's oh, man, I haven't answered to... any questions for a really long <laughs> for time. Like so this is uh, this is going to be testing. Right, right. Well, good because we got my questions. Brain a tiny bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start with some easy ones, but the um. Tell us about the slits, right? Because it was that was that was like was that fair? To, is it fair to say that that's the first group that you you were a part of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside of like groups that I was in at school with my school friends, you know, that was uh, that was my first uh, introduction into into the world of being in a band and playing live, which is quite mad, actually, to, mm -hmm. to say. Um, how did it come about uh well again like obviously I've, I've through my through my parents connection i've known ari my my whole life and she has sons a, a similar age to me so when she was in london throughout my childhood like she'd you know she'd swing by and fly in here and there and she was always just one of those kind of she was just one of those wild people that would just sort of appear and disappear. There right. were there are a few of those in in my life growing up, but Ari was always um, a very memorable one. And in kind of true Ari chaos and fashion, I remember I was at um, I was I was at college on my last day of college. I went to um, 
to study to be a makeup artist actually a long time ago and I was doing my final day and I had an exam and my mum called me and was like Ari's in London and she's recording some new Smiths music and she wants you to come and record some backing vocals wow. it's at this address go kind of thing and I was like <laughs> okay sure and it just, it just happened to be like 15 minutes away from where I already was so it was like a cool bit of um location fate and so I showed up and then it, it turned out that she'd kind of like been pooling around all her friends collecting their daughters to do uh a, like a group vocal take on on a slit song that was called slits tradition um that came out on an ep called revenge of the killer slits in 2006 so i just showed up there to this studio and she kind of behaved like i'd seen her yesterday she was like oh yeah hey come in so here it goes like this is what it sounds like and we're gonna do this and it's gonna be a big girl gang and blah blah, blah. and uh, she just like chucked me in the booth and and away i went and then we um we hung out for a bit and it was really cool and fun, but just like a real, if like in my memory, it all happened in like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, oh, we're going to play live soon. You should come and play. You should come and you should join us and sing. And I was like, yeah, great. That sounds cool. Kind of, you know, sometimes these things can just be like flipping empty comments yeah. that don't right. mean anything, but I, learn over time that pretty much everything that Ari up says she does mean and i yeah i they did a rehearsal or two for some gigs and it was like the first time i'd been in a rehearsal space and played with other musicians and wow. i was like all overwhelmed and i didn't know like really any of the songs but she was just like just copy me and and do this. just like she was just always very cool and very casual about what i was there to do which i suppose i realized was just down to like trust in my uh, ability so that was uh, something that i never really figured out until way later on in like retrospect mm -hmm. um so yeah then i just fell in love with doing that and being surrounded by powerful women and being in a band that was like a really a really wonderful thing like i was 19 when that happened and i had wow. i was at the same time i was at um at a music college i went to few different colleges did a few different things mm -hmm. um, and I was only halfway through my course at the music college but then we went on a on a tour or two like we did a few shows in Europe and then we did a tour in America and which was six weeks long and I was only meant to stay for two weeks because I was meant to go back to school and literally after like the first show I was like I'm not, I'm not gonna go home I think there I'm you gonna go. like travel across America with these wild women in a car and see what happens was that your first time to, to America it wasn't my first time to America it was my first time touring in America right. it was my first time touring anywhere right. it was like six weeks across the whole damn country that's crazy wow. <laughs> what was that what was it like you mentioned you were just saying how like she, Ari was very um like casual and just like, oh yeah just you know you'll get it was that like because there are two kinds of people like some people are like really embrace that like okay cool that's perfect and then others like and i feel like i'm more like the second way like i would be like terrified of that you know like if i'm gonna sing harmonies i'm like no no no, no. like i need let's we need to practice this like i need to know like yeah, what right. my part is like yeah. how so how that like how was that for you were you, were you like okay or, were you, or did you did you appreciate that like right off the bat you know I, a, a bit of both really, because I was kind of like, oh, I could do with some structure right, and some yeah. direction. But then I also did just kind of feed off of her energy with that. And I, you know, I really like singing with other singers and harmonizing. So it was just kind of like a natural bit of fun and to and to and like back and forth with each other. And so, yeah, over the years, that kind of just became the thing. And, you know, I'm I'm very much like vocally, if I'm not singing lead, I really like to 
follow. So mm-hmm. if someone is away doing something like I feel like I know or enjoy what I enjoy about like harmonizing or joining in with that in some way. So that's yes. And maybe that's where I got it from originally mm. was from like that being the, the normal thing that I was introduced to as far as being a singer is concerned. And you have that song, the, I think it's the opening song off twice, right? Are you up? Yeah. Yeah. What a cool number. Yeah, yeah, it was, was ju- it was just so necessary. I when, uh, Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the timeline now. I mean, Ari must have passed away sometime in between my first album and my second album. She must have done, yeah. Uh, so there was just there was nothing else to do than like write a write a song about her, like that was that was a happy song that was like a, a, like a celebrating her song. You know, I I didn't want it to be like a a sad a sad mm-hmm. one i wanted it to be something but i always feel joy when i hear or when i have to sing you know mm-hmm. yeah no it, is, it definitely accomplishes that nice up tempo groove the way it comes in and starts with your vocals i mean it's a it's one of, it was one of my favorites to rock out with you um, when we did that set for ah time. nice so. yeah in fact i say, speaking about it now makes me want to play it live again because i don't think i've played oh. it live since since then oh so, okay. yeah because i remember as well that was a thing for me because we sang that song we played that song in our set, maybe even first, and being in yeah. Sierra Nevada um, Music Festival. Where is it in Boonville? Is that the yeah, area? it's yeah. northern Northern California, super north. I mean, which is just like one of the most beautiful, glorious places yeah. that you can be, and like just having like trees and mountains in front of me and singing that song, I almost couldn't hold it together because I was just like. <laughs> Whoa, this is a powerful place and I'm feeling a lot of things and she would have liked this. She would have liked this. Oh, for sure. <laughs> How beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Boonville. I, 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 I forgot that that was the name of the city for sure. Boonville. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it started, that festival started, it's called the Sierra Nevada World Music Festival, not to get into the history of the Sierra Nevada World Music Festival, <laughs> but it used to be in the Sierra Nevada mountains, mm. in, the, in the foothills, in a place called not Marysville. Me. That's where it started, Angels Camp over there and then they moved it to Boonville right and they might have moved it back I forget it's like moved around but that they kept the name because I yeah I know some people are like this says it's not close to this year in Nevada it's, yeah. like, <laughs> coast, it's like coastal but yeah it's a great I, I miss you know and big up uh, R.I.P. Warren Smith he R. passed R. Warren, yeah. yeah he passed Warren this year Smith. but he was you know he ran that festival and it really was for a long time the greatest like American reggae festival they did such a good job of like booking just incredible artists like you could yeah. go I, there was a span that i went every year and you could go and just like you know you could see midnight and desiree and then like at the same time like johnny clark and the mighty diamonds and then there'd be like you know modern artists you know not at that time it was that was before the like american modern thing really started you know yeah. but it'd be like modern jamaican artists and like uk artists that was just a great festival yeah, i miss it i miss Sierra nevada yeah. and I miss, you know i guess we all miss performing right and that must be crazy for you like have you performed a live show yet since the pandemic started? No, um, mm. I have. Um, I have featured as a guest artist for a couple of Gentlemen's Dub Club live streams, mm. um, which is an outlet of sorts. But mm. obviously, it's not. It's not quite the same. It's. It's a great kind of middleman, but it's. It's one song, and it's in front of cameras. And right. It's a different vibe, so no, I meant to have festivals to play shortly, but I don't know yet. We yeah, we right. don't know if the if the future of that is secure just yet. The near future, at least, anyway. So. Right. right, and as soon as those gates open, man, it's just going to be boom, 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 festival after festival. Yeah, I think, I think everybody can't wait for it. Like everybody's not- ready, whether it's just attending or or performing like right. i'm, I'm I, even if i don't get to perform at any i still want to be at one right at some point. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> yeah. which like might like that you can't always say that you know i feel like you get to a point in your career where you're playing so many shows that the idea like your views toward being an audience member kind of change you know not from like an egotistical standpoint but just from like 
you know, I'm not sure. It's like, uh, why do I want to spend my off time at work? Like kind of thing. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. And, I, and, I, I just love it. Festivals, I just think, yeah. it's just one of the, the greatest inventions and creations for, uh, for a thing to do. Um, yeah, I, I, in fact, a couple of years ago, was not playing at Rotterdam, but just went for a week anyway, cool. just because it was just, it's just, it's just so much fun. It's right. just a cool thing. Nice. Yeah. Did you, has the, has not performing for this long changed your, like, your, your outlook on performing at all or your feelings toward it? Like, you know, yeah. was there like, has it? I don't know if there was any burnout for you at any point. That's like, you know, the pandemic has kind of dissipated or. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I'm very, very intrigued and interested to know how I deal again when it comes back, when I get to do it. Uh, my outlook will be really different, I think. I have, uh, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that I have enjoyed not performing for a long period of time i think that it's worked wonders on my emotional state and nice. generally speaking just help me to reset and figure out how to proceed going forward um i realized that i you know not that it's necessarily a bad thing either but i probably put well i know i put a lot of pressure on myself when it comes to playing shows i'm I'm quite shy and quite introverted. So I think that being on stage a lot, like super regularly was starting to um, just af affect my mental health a little bit. And even it's a it's a really confusing juxtaposition of things because I love it so much in one way, but in another way, I like hiding and not being center of attention. So go figure as to how I ended up here. <laughs> no, I, I'm sure. And you know, it's funny you say that, you know you you admit that you don't mind the time off. I think a, I think more musicians than not are in that that pocket, you know, because we've all been there where you're on tour and it's grueling, but then you have extreme highs and extreme lows sometimes, and yeah. and it's just nice to get that reset, like you said, very well. Yeah, spoken, yeah, you know? totally. It's never been something that I dread, but it's always right. something that I'm now I will. I mean, of course, like most things, I'll, I'll appreciate it loads more. And I think that, again, it's something that I'm not sure if it's going to stick or not, but I don't, I feel like I have just sort of like, you know, worked with myself and on myself. So I have like a bit more confidence and self-belief than I had before. So, and also just to really just remember to, uh, to, to chill and enjoy yeah, exactly <laughs> and spread the good vibes crazy like, yeah. we're gonna see a whole new holly cook come out on stage like <laughs> what's up everyone all in their face and everything <laughs> rage yeah. like aggro raging just raging yeah, yeah. you're playing I, guitar I, I, i'm like whoa <laughs> holly plays guitar crazy look at her go suddenly she's an crazy. extrovert she's I, an extra yeah, I, wonder, I wonder how many shows it will take for me to retreat back into my shell again <laughs> definitely <laughs> Um, we definitely have to touch on, on the subject because we had we had him on the show um, a while back. But um, Mike Prince Fatty was on the show and, oh, he's done, yeah, he, yeah. and he's done some work with you. Um, it was for me discovering kind of you guys at the same time. It was it was like two different major flavors coming together to, to create one. You know, it wasn't like, oh, there was just this is like a Prince Fatty production. It was like, no, this is like a Holly Cook, you know, song. And then the secondary would is like the fatty production, and then there's some times where it's it's you know switched. So what was that like working with them? Because you've you've worked with them all, with more than one album, right? Two, we got two yeah, albums. two albums over not ten years, but close to you know we were working together since like 2006. It was like we worked together like on and off for eight years because. Um, if it wasn't like Holly Cook records, it was uh, Prince Fatty releases or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we spent a lot of time on the road together as well. Um, yeah, I mean that's for me. That's where it, that's where it all started. That's how it came about. Like I was in the slits when I met him, and mm. I had I've been um, always had the idea that I wanted to do my my own solo stuff as well. Anyway. Um, 
and when I was in the slits is when I realized that reggae was actually a, a really natural avenue for me to take. Um, and a friend of mine met Mike at a recording session and was like, and he had a demo of his, like, I don't even think it was an album. He just had like a few demos. So he gave it to my friend and my friend was like, you've got to hear this guy's stuff. And I think you guys should meet and see if something can work here. Um, so X, Y, Z, and we did. And, he, you know, he was very cool and up for having me come to the studio and just seeing what what might happen, you know? He was super, super casual and up for it. Um, so I went to visit him in Brighton and, um, and Milk and Honey is what we recorded. Just, it was a, it was, he was like, oh, I've had this song lying around for a while, don't really know what to do. My friend, my friend wrote it, um, gave it a whirl. And, wow. um, and I did. And Such a great song, man. Like, so that's a perfect great. example of what I was saying, is it like the music itself is awesome. And then what you do to it is awesome. It's like two different great pieces coming together. You know, I don't right. think there's like a priority, you know, in, in yeah. either. Um, and of course, that's the title. Is it the first song off uh, the self-titled album? Am I correct? In um, yeah, 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 it okay. is. Originally, it was released as a Prince Fatty single. Mm. Um, and mm, maybe it was on his first album. I can't, I don't think it was. Uh, I can't remember. But we just, yeah, we kind of refreshed it a little bit. And uh and yeah, and again, made it a, a Holly Cook song. Like we were hanging out and I just go down to Brighton every now and again. And so he has this um, wonderful um, friend called Bart Corbelet, who's like a French poet. He's a really, really glorious songwriter. And he, um, they'd worked together on a few of Bart's albums. He's got a super cool kind of rock, rock vibe. Um, French rock, I guess. Um, but yeah, he would write these kooky, ethereal songs over Mike's rhythms, and I would just try singing them. So we did, we did Milk and Honey, Sugar Water, and um, Body Beat. I think mm. were the three songs like over the course of six months, and we were like, oh, this is this is cute, <laughs> this is nice, we can see some consistency and it's working, like maybe we should um, do like two more and release an EP under like a separate project name that would be, you know, Holly, Fatty and Bart and come up with a name for it. Um, and at that time he was releasing his records through Mr. Bongo. So he spoke to Mr. Bongo about it as an idea. They were really into it, but they were keen to make it an album and to make it a Holly Cook album. So nice. that's just, it all kind of just came together like supernaturally and everyone was just very up for giving it a go. And I was just, following the good vibes because that's what I always that's what I've always done nice. and um and then the first album came out of that um half of which was yeah semi unintentional really we were just like getting to know each other through studio sessions and hanging out and singing some songs so then when we made the the deliberate move to like turn it into a full length project then like then um shadow kissing and that very night came and then uh the other songs that are on <laughs> there you go yeah shadow kissing's a hit i love that yeah. one too Aww. did you like uh when you uh, as a songwriter do you like to hear like a, a rhythm first and then write to it or do you come kind of like with some stuff already and and get fatty to build some rhythms Mostly that, to be honest, like through working with Fatty, because a lot of the like, because those first five tunes, I didn't, I didn't write them, which I was actually really comfortable with. I was not confident in my songwriting ability mm. at that point. I would never have pulled off something like that very nice. So, um, but then there was, then there was 
cry and used to be which i wrote which i think are, you know as as much as i love them they're a slightly as i see them now as like a maybe more uh uh beginner's version of like learning how to write songs which is also cool but yeah i'm very much uh i'm very melody driven so i will either be really happy listening to an instrumental and feel out some vibes that's usually how it works i, I find it quite inspiring hearing the music and then writing on top of it a, a top line writer if you will mm -hmm. um <laughs> and then but then sometimes again, like I will have an idea, but it, again, it will always be a melody and my like instrumental skills are fairly limited. I can kind of work out a few things, but living with Luke is super handy because he's a keys whiz. So nice. if I can give him like some root notes, he can help me like work out the chords around it and then form the rest of the song. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mine, I mean, I, if, if, the, if the instrumental's got some vibes, then I'm I'm gonna be generally more than happy like writing so, along to that. So that was your first like f those tunes that you mentioned were your first like foray into songwriting. You weren't really like dabbling in it before. Not in a not in a way that anything came of. You know, right. in fact, right. Cry was actually Cry was a song I wrote for the Slits originally. Oh, okay, nice. It's on, mm. a, it's on this. We released a record as the reformed lineup of the Slits. Uh, maybe in like 2010 and at that point I'd been working with Fatty for a little bit and so Ari was kind of like you write one of your little write one of your lovers tunes you do the <laughs> that thing so I wrote Cry for for Ari really and for the Slits so there's like a super cute Slits version of that floating around I gotta check um, that out. and then and then we we re and then Fatty reworked it mm. And, and so at this point, you know, where you're, you're like, I'm going to do this solo thing. I'm going to go for it. I, you know, I like reggae. Let's let's make it happen. Both your parents being musicians and not just, you know, average musicians. I mean, geez, you know, your dad being Sex Pistols, your mom singing in Culture Club. What are what are their thoughts? Are they very supportive? Um, are they kind of like, well, you know, the music thing is kind of a you know, unique occupation here. <laughs> they had sussed out a long time before that that that's what i was going to try and do and mm. that's what i was trying to do from the age of about uh 16 or 17 i'd been working with a few different kind of songwriters and producers here and there and just trying to make connections and and create stuff all of which was great experience but at that time even you know they were like we we fully support this this is very cool if this is what you want to do know that it's a completely unreliable source of of income <laughs> and lifestyle if if that's cool then great but you might not make it you might not make any money you uh, you might be let down by a ton of people you might be fucked over by a ton of people like they were very they were just very realistic mm -hmm. about how it is so i just i had a kind of had a fairly straight version of how I thought it might go so they were always very cool even down to me like leaving school to be in bands and stuff they were just sort of like <laughs> we get it yeah <laughs> and I'm like fuck we can't say anything we can't they know they can't they don't yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, shit. Really, we did this you know? to ourselves yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, they they just been very very cute and cool about the whole thing, and they've been my my biggest cheerleaders throughout the whole thing. That's super cool. Like that. Have Have you ever have you guys done a song yet together where like you guys are featured on the same tune? Um, kind of. Mm -hmm. We, me and my dad, me and my dad performed together for the first time, like flowers a long time ago like 10 8 8 years ago maybe but that wasn't for a record but I did just just last week I just recorded some vocals for a song for my dad's band my dad's wow. been making music um 
uh, with his band, The Professionals, which was the band that he uh, formed with Steve Jones um, after the Sex Pistols broke up. And he's been continuing that project over the last five years, which has been really cool to see. And he's been just grabbing life by the balls and doing nice. doing the thing. And he's been going on tour and it's been super, nice. super cool. Um, so yeah, they wrote a song about an incident that involved me so they asked me to sing on it i don't know whether i'm gonna make the cut though my dad was like it sounds a bit too nice <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> how great is that right <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. so we'll see maybe <laughs> we have, maybe we haven't uh, I don't know if yet. that happens you just got to do it right back to me dad I'm, i got this new tune i want you to throw some drums on there I'm and like, you know what the snare was a little yeah. ringy yeah. on that one <laughs> we didn't end up using your tracks we'll pop see. sorry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's so really funny for so, sure yeah. so tell us about i, I want to know the the tropical pop um is that something that you you know you described yourself as is it something like you know a, a article described your sound as i used it a long long time ago when there was a little thing called MySpace. Remember that, kids? Oh, yes. oh yeah. <laughs> and I put some music on MySpace that wasn't any of the stuff that you now know as me. And you could put whatever genre you wanted in the little genre box. So that's what I put. Um, nice. It was not hugely thought out. And then I continued to use it and uh, in a really kind of uh, tropical pop, it was very like kind of very casual thing um not and 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 then just like ever since then it's just been something that people have really like latched onto as as a term for the for what my what i call the genre of music that i make so i yeah, it's it's been said back to me so many times in the last ten years. I've got, I'm really I'm quite surprised by that. Some people are, are like pissed off at me for saying I thought like, oh, I didn't know I like tropical pop. I thought I was listening to reggae, and it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, you are like lighten yeah. up. It's just that like, yeah, right. thing. <laughs> I, I think it's a perfect uh, description because it it's not lying. No, nothing is lying. You know, tropical pop. Okay, yeah. It does the the sound that you project and and the productions you know people you work with. Um, it doesn't. It's not just okay. Here's just some generic reggae for you. This is an influence. It's a whole you know combination of different yeah. musics and uh, and then the vibe you carry and then the the vibe you know that comes with the art for the albums and stuff like that. I think it's great. It's a, and without even trying too hard on a marketing tip. It's like it all makes sense. So. Right. You, know, um, you started a genre. Yeah. <laughs> you started its own genre. I mean, I, it's something that I could easily see like other bands being like, like how the two tone thing started, you know, with the specials. And yeah, then, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then all of a sudden you got like five or six bands that are calling themselves, you know, two tone music, you know, tropical pop. Devin, you and me are starting a tropical pop band. Let's do, do it. it. And we'll be in the, in the sub genre as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's just, you know, it's just nice to identify with something. Obviously, I identify as a reggae artist and a pop artist. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess I've come to not, I've, I've grown more used to people kind of describing me more as like a soul singer which i never really saw myself it's all it's, it's all in there you know yeah. um, so if I, I i like the 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 broader term of of the tropical pop thing because it's then you know no one's going to be upset when i don't do what i said i was going to do <laughs> <laughs> right no that's true because you are like <laughs> any artist is, is like taking some risks when they label themselves as some some genre that that already exists right especially you know especially something that's like like reggae you know what i mean because there are those there's those purists who are always going to come out of the woodworks no matter what like and just be yeah. like well that's not what you know that's not what would have happened in 1973 on a rhythm like that you know it's like there's always yeah. people like that you know so yeah, it's you, can you, can't. you yeah. can't win them all <laughs> you can't you cannot win them all but tropical pop, you can do whatever you want. So I like exactly. that. Exactly. It's my club. I'll <laughs> yeah. do what I like. Yeah. <laughs> and you say people call you a soul singer at times. And, and when I listen to the song, um, which the music video is pretty dope, the uh, Dance in the Sunshine. 
oh, that, that nice. tune. I mean, that is a total tune where you could be like, oh, yeah, Holly Cook's a soul singer because for some reason that comes off as more soulful than a lot yeah. of other yeah, stuff. I feel like as I as I mature as a vocalist, the soulful side of coming was out that more. was that song included on any album or was it kind of like a one off dance in the That sunshine? was just a one off. Um, it was a, a couple of years ago. I sat down with Ben, my the the drummer in my in my live show, Ben McCone, who is also the producer of Dance in the Sunshine and Superstar and one of the other covers that we did but that was the first time that we sat down like as band members and wrote together before that you know we started playing together after a lot of the stuff had already been written and recorded like many moons before so yeah we we've grown to a point now where we want to we want to create we spend so much time together we like all the same stuff we were like let's try writing some songs so Dance in the Sunshine was one of the first ones that that came out of it, and it was just <laughs> something to do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we Definitely. wanted to record a like to shoot a video for it as well, and record as a live band. That was right at the beginning of uh, the birth of Crosstown Studios, which is Ben and Toby from Gentleman's Dub Club Studio. So we wanted to put put the place to to good use you know mm -hmm, right so that was like our first uh first venture and since then we've written and recorded a whole album together so nice did you um you mentioned like feeling like you matured as a vocalist on songs like that did you did you go when you were in music school before you before you left to do the tour was that where you were studying voice um yeah yeah vo like yeah voice live performance theory um piano like it's just kind of like a broad a broad thing but i went there specifically as a vocalist yeah. what do you I, I never went to any kind of music school what 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 like live performance what do they what do they talk about in live performance it uh it's more of kind of just experiencing being on a stage and playing with other musicians um is more the thing and yeah maybe it's like it's like super kind of almost obvious stuff like learning microphone technique mm -hmm. and a stage presence and communication with mm -hmm. other band members and just stuff that is kind of natural if you're doing it but i suppose depending on <laughs> what area you go into if you're in a in a profession a musical profession where you do a ton of functions and you show up with a bunch of people that you don't necessarily play with a ton you as a singer may find it useful to know how to direct and cue or whatever do you know what i mean it was sure. kind of like it was just getting into all that kind of nitty gritty stuff that's a trip. I didn't know they had classes like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, That's how I'm, I remember it. Anyway. I'm going to start a class and it's going to be called touring. And it's going to be like, all right, Sheesh, in this, in this uh, today's class, we're going to talk about you hurry up, get there and wait. So for some <laughs> check, all right. In this lesson, we're going to talk about waking up at two in the morning to catch a plane <laughs> to France and sound check will be. The, yeah. The, yeah, the the, the <laughs> art of using the bathroom between the end of the set and encore. <laughs> yeah, the art. There needs yeah. to be a class on that. Yeah, training your bladder to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you yeah. ask for on a hospitality rider? Well, you do, yeah, there should be those kind of things, right? Yeah. No, no one, no one teaches yeah. you about all the other. The, the, the school the, of Roger. I want to. I want to go there. <laughs> well, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen for sure. <laughs> I love it. Um, Devin, should we jump into the uh, the rapids? I think it's time. So yeah, before we let you go, Miss Holly Cook, we ha always like to do this uh, segment with our guests where we ask them. It's like a rapid fire lightning round, if you will. We're just going to ask you a few questions. It doesn't have to be long answers. First thing that comes to your mind. I actually got to pull up my list here, Raj. So why don't you go? Why don't you go first? Yeah, yeah, I'll go first. So Holly, what was the first? album you remember buying spice girls spice world yes Ooh, nice <laughs> yes dang that's a good one uh what was the last thing you listened to before this interview today uh 
self-esteem it's a she's a great artist from manchester i think she's got an amazing new record called oh, i can't remember what it's called but self-esteem nice mm, i like it out of the two famous jamaican music movies what do you prefer what's your go-to harder they come or rockers rockers, rockers that seems to be winning. the unanimous yeah, answer unanimous. really yeah oh yeah <laughs> for sure it's my answer too um not you know, nothing wrong with the harder they come, but like rockers, wow. Uh, speaking of hospitality writers, what is your favorite item on the hospitality writer? Cognac. Ooh, oh, I like it, dude. Okay, Cognac. so thank you. I've been waiting for an answer like that. A lot of times, people are like, "Oh, you know." Yeah. Just I we just had gotta... Al Barozzi was on the show yesterday. He said, oh, um, "He said a couch." He said he doesn't have a writer. He's like, "Oh, I don't submit a writer. I just I just want a couch." But see, that was a great answer too. I was, I was appraising him for that, but I, I got. I was like, "Is that a low bar?" No, I don't. Know. <laughs> it is like <laughs> it's kind of cool. It it's kind of cool because it's like he doesn't have a hospitality writer, so he can be like, "Well, look, I'm not making you go get me Jaeger and Red Bulls here. <laughs> Just give me a couch, and we're cool. We're straight." You know. I guess to me, that question is really like, "What do you like to drink at shows?" You know. So yeah. that, that, that's. <laughs> I'm glad you answered it that way. Thank you. Yeah. I've been with that. I, that means a lot to me. Thank you. I'd rather have I'd rather have cognac than a couch. You know? Yeah, I don't yeah, even I'll, I'll couch. sit on the floor the and drink yeah, cognac. Yeah. Like, Come on, yeah. you got a patch of grass. We're I'll cool. be leaning against the wall over here. Yeah, you? but yeah. <laughs> um, what was the um, last show you attended as an audience member? Oh my gosh, the last show was so long ago. Mm -hmm. That's a rough one because of COVID lockdown stuff, but. It was, honestly, probably it was the skins at the electric. Yeah. Nice. Oh, the skins. Yeah. Skins are good friends. I mean, they always <laughs> big you up too, obviously. I know that's a, you guys just click over there. Um, we had Josh on the show. It was, and, and John. Josh is, and, and John, yeah. And then Devin's band, uh, Expanders, toured with the Skints. Yeah, yeah, we did a, yeah. Yeah, we did a cool, like, co-headlining West Coast tour. I think it was, like, 2016 or something, 2017. That That's was nice my, time, my favorite it? my favorite tour I've ever done. Like, I bet. I believe you. One it of was just, like, I was, as well. I, I, I've never had, like, withdrawals, like, from being around a group of people the way I did, like, when that tour was over. I was, like, I was, like, legit like sad in my heart like yeah. oh man i like really miss these people <laughs> excellent human beings love you skints they are yeah. and like i love to see the way they are together like it's nice to see a group of like really good friends like yeah. you can tell like they all really like each other which is like so refreshing to see yeah you know? yeah it's a it's a close-knit little friendship gang that is. yeah yeah it me and devin is. try to be like that but i don't know no, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no. Yeah. it's all an act <laughs> Devin, next, next question, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um Okay, I know there are like lots of answers to this question, but just like first thing that comes to your head, um, from just a purely like tone of voice like standpoint, your favorite Jamaican singer? Dennis Brown. Ooh. That's the correct answer. Yes, yes. You're getting ding, all, ding, the right ding, ding, ding. all the right People answers. People think these are open-ended questions. They are, nope. they are not. Oh, yes. They're correct they're answers, not. and you are getting them all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, how crazy would that be if I had it on a sheet and I did show you the sheet? I've like, got it in my head. Like, That's and crazy. So, so far, she's, a few of them, she's totally she's <laughs> nailed. <laughs> a very similar question, but a little different. Who's one of your favorite or, or your favorite singers, modern singers, not like a legacy singer, just in general right now in the modern scene? Um, in the modern reggae scene, or in it could be, it could even go outside of reggae. Just what what you think right now? Okay, um, right now I am for like right now and for a long time I've been feeling um, Yukimi from Little Dragon. I think mm. she's just got Love Little Dragon. She's got something else. She's got something different that a lot of people don't have, and I I'm here for that. Nice. nice. That's, yeah. okay, well, okay, so. A little sub question to that. What about in like the modern reggae scene? Could be modern Jamaican, could be like, you know, UK, American, whatever. Oi, oh, probably Savannah, you know. I think that she is power, soul, femininity. She's got some, she's got some pipes. 
beautiful mm-hmm. pipes in there. Well, I'm just going to like admit at the risk of looking super lame that I don't, I don't know Savannah. So I'm going to have to check that out. Her last EP is really nice. She's got some really, really cool stuff on there. She's, uh, she's part of the little, the, the cool, the cool, cute crew. She's like with like Naomi Cowan and Lena Ike and. Nice. Oh, nice. Okay. That whole, that whole girl gang out there that are doing the, doing the, the big queen thing at the moment. Nice. All right. Oh, cool. Man. Well, you've given me some some listening homework. Thank you, Rod. Yeah, you got, yeah, you're you got welcome. The, <laughs> yes, you got the last question, Rod. All right. Cool. Cool. So, what's your favorite place to play in the world? Mm-hmm. It's cool when you have to think about that because you've gotten to play in some good places in the world. Right? Of course. Of course. <laughs> Oh, question. there are, there is, okay, there are two, but I mean, I would have to say actually, um, Mexico. Crazy. There, yeah, it is, cra- it is crazy. Mm-hmm. I don't know how or why or what happened, but, um, people really like my music there. <laughs> and I have never had an audience reception like I have in Mexico City wow. before in particular. Mexico City. Um, yeah, like quite quite scary, more than overwhelming, <laughs> and just like wild, pretty pretty wild energy. I I I felt like Katy Perry. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, they were crazy. I've I've often heard you described as the Katy Perry of Mexico City. So <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Katy Perry of reggae, they said. Um, yeah, so that one is. I've, I've only played. I've played there a couple of times, and it's left a extremely lasting impression every time. Have you performed all over Mexico? No, in Mexico City, two, three times. I haven't managed to get anywhere else yet. Cool. So. That's so cool. Yeah, it's very. What cool. was the other place you said there were possibly two places? Um. I don't remember the name. Oh, that's okay. Place, Mexico City is good enough. That, that's a great answer. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't a it, oh, uh, in, we played in Acapulco as well. Actually, they've got a very cool festival okay. out there. Nice. Um, but there was another. But there was uh, we. I went with with Blake actually and a couple of the other guys to. Mm. Um, that's right, Blake. Uh, uh, oh, Jamie, like, Jamie on keyboards, right? He's a phenomenal keyboard player. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Pat, Patrick was on. Yeah, there. yeah, Patrick was there. I think. And it was then, Patrick, Jamie, uh, what's the gentleman's Blake. name? Jared. And, Jared. Um, yeah. And Jared. Yeah, we were all there at this festival, very near Mexico City as well, um, called Bahia Dora, and it was wow. very, very, very cool. Very nice. Crazy. Place. That's cool. I mean, Roger, I've never performed in Mexico, but Roger, you can attest to that, right? Like, they got a pretty I was, crazy, like, ska and reggae scene. Yeah, I was I'm just recently trying to get uh, Devin to come DJ with me in Mexico, trying to see if that works out with, uh, you know, lockdown and things opening up. Yeah, but, yeah, yes, yeah. in general, Mexico gets down. Yeah. And it's it's like a bittersweet thing for me when I go to Mexico because, like, check it out. If no one knows me, they're going to think, okay, Roger can throw down some Spanish. Yeah. But it's not the truth. So I'll go over there and I'll be rocking out, you know, playing either keyboards <laughs> or DJ. And they come up and it's like, and you know, Royer, Royer, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dang, bro. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I can't help you. Where's Google Translate that? Like... <laughs> yeah, I'm like, dude. Yeah. So, anyways, I gotta learn Spanish, before, you know, before I go. They gotta learn Spanish because yeah. they're, right, they're well, gonna they're gonna hey. start to to really look down on that. Like, what the? Come on, bro. Come on. It's about time you you know you know more than taco. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, their the crowds are insane over there, and and there's, yeah. there's no surprise yeah. to me that they'd be so into you because the yeah yeah beautiful sure. energy. I think that's it for the rapid fire segment. That is it. You pass with flying <laughs> colors. Yes. <laughs> nice. Well. Miss Holly Cook, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, before before we let you go, is there anything you want to tell the people, make sure they know about, you know, to look from, from you coming soon? Yeah, just, um, hi, everyone. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I am literally on the final mix session of finishing an album. So nice. just uh, keep your ear to the ground because I'm going to start releasing music quite, quite soon and I'm, I'm excited. It's a, it's a, a, the album creation has gotten me through this 
bloody pandemic so uh it's it, uh, yeah a lot of heart has gone into this one I'm, I'm excited to share nice we're excited too i can't wait to hear what like so many people have done this last year you know because you know that, that musicians have been recording and i just feel like there's going to be this flood of music and i can't wait to hear it yeah um, yeah i think we're we're all about to, to be blessed with everyone's uh creative uh, coping mechanisms <laughs> yes <laughs> Dang, that's, definitely. that's true <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you so much. We know it's getting. What time is it over there, by the way? It's nine thirty p.m. It's. Mm. I keep because it looks like sunlight. Be, it looks like sunlight behind you. <laughs> Why does it? It's I, oh, it's oh, it's almost like that. Is just the that's oh, just the map. But that, you, this this little tiny blue sliver mm -hmm. here is the color of the sky. Okay. So oh. The sun's only just gone down. It's this is the first day of sun that we've had the of heat and sun in. 2021 wow. So wow. it's been a good day in the uk everyone's starting to feel a touch more positive about the world because it's been miserable yeah, right, for right. Sure. <laughs> well that's good to hear and there will be a touch more positivity being added sooner than later when holly cook's new album comes out everyone please keep on the lookout for that and until we see you again, thank you so much for coming on the show. We Thanks really appreciate so it. Yes. It's been Thanks super nice to talk me. to you. Yes, of course. It's been great to see you guys. Yes. All right. Be good. Stay safe. And we will see you soon. Miss Holly Cook. Goodbye. We'll see you, Holly. <laughs> Yay. Miss Holly Cook. Oh, man. Such a pleasure talking to her. And 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 um, she's just so real. I love it. Like like I said, when we did those two days and you were chilling and just being real about it. You know what I mean? She's a real artist. She's a legit real artist. She really is. And, you know, like her fans like love Holly Cook. You know what I mean? Mm. Like Dude, when she played when she played over here, you know, yeah. It's just she's a legend in the making because it's that same she's energy. Made. She, I would she's say made. She's, she's a legend. She's a legend. She's a legend. Um, it's that same energy that you see when people go up to like a legacy artist or something, you know, where it's like, take a picture of me, the autographs, the, mm -hmm. the emotion. It's like she could easily have had, you know, many albums already out and, and you know, yeah, it's that kind of energy. And when she came to L.A., that's when I really saw it because it's like, OK, I got all my peers and colleagues and, you know, people we know in, in right. the reggae scene kind of just like in awe with their eyes open. And I'm like, wow, this is I mean, awesome. You're, you were totally like you totally nailed it earlier when you were saying how like, you know, we know how the scene here is, you know, the kind of like L.A. Mm -hmm. like rock steady snobbery, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Where it's mm -hmm. like they're really like looking at you mm -hmm. and yeah like everyone in that scene like loves holly cook you know what i loves mean her. which is cool because her music is i mean it's obviously like super heavily influenced by that stuff but it's not like a purist you know what i mean it's not like she's right. trying as hard as she can to you know make sure every song sounds like it was recorded in 1969 or 1966 or whatever you know what i mean so so for it to like shine through and reach those like what i call the la snob lovingly <laughs> lovingly i've been one myself many times yes. i call it the la snobbery you know rock steady snobs for that for, for that scene to like embrace it you know what i mean right. it's like really dope you know it just shows sure. like how bad she is you know what i'm saying like yep all of her tough, influences coming tough. through for sure well um this has been it's been a great episode um, yeah man and what do you got coming up, Raj? Well, what, what, what I got cracking is uh, depending on when this, this episode hits. Um, That's right. These I would say, things, it's hard to do these like personal promos. Yeah. Right? So who knows? <laughs> the future Roger is, is predicting the past Roger stuff. No. <laughs> um, uh, I'd say, look, it, go to my uh, Instagram, reggae underscore Raj. Um, and that's where I like to just keep everyone updated on what I'm doing. I do have a lot of things cracking this year. And so go there. Social media will show you the way. I got some new music coming out. And I will be touring a lot of cool spots um, all over the world, really. So go check my Instagram out. And Devin, are you going to be doing, are you foreseeing the songbook sessions go throughout 2021? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I don't know. You know, so we, if you're listening to this. Whenever this episode airs, it could be that I've stopped doing them, you know. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they're all gonna—they're gonna be on YouTube. So either way, you there know, you if you go just Google like "Man Like Devin Songbook Sessions," you can see all the. I think I've done like somewhere in the forties, um, mm -hmm. you know, songbook session where I just I sing acoustic music. Um, and speaking of acoustic music, if you go to manlikedevin.com, you can get my new album. Uh, it's it's going to be out, or it is out. <laughs> Wheel and Shoulder is the name of it. Acoustic Scott, Rocksteady 
and Reggae Volume 1 is the name of the record. Uh, really, really stoked on it. I, I recorded it with Roger Rivas and my brother Patrick. My dad's on a track. The California Honey Drops, the great California yeah. Honey Drops are on a track. Um, 100% acoustic reggae album. If you are, uh, you know, familiar with the Expanders, it's, you know, same same style because I, I wrote all the, all the songs, you know, right? So there's like, obviously, like some sim- similarities. I haven't really changed my writing style, but what's different is instead of, you know, the heavy, heavy rhythms of the expanders. It's the uh, heavy acoustic rhythms of me and my brother, Patrick. And mm-hmm. I think people will like it. It features uh, this. If you're watching this, I don't, I don't know how to point this heavy kete drum made the by drum. the great Zion Love Sound yeah, and uh, my guitar, which is not in the room right now, carved by my it grandfather is in the back on the other side. Now, that's not it. That's oh. uh, this is my brother's guitar, which I oh. do use a lot. But on the album, my my before he passed, my grandpa on my dad's side mm-hmm. uh, made me a guitar. He was a great what? woodworker. He his his uh, his career was as an upholsterer. But when he retired, he started uh, creating little cool like just figurines of animals and all kinds of uh-huh. cool stuff out of wood. And he even had some stuff like featured in a in a museum in uh, Ventura, California, where they lived. And like cool stuff, like the thing that was in the museum was this bear he carved as a mm-hmm. wooden bear riding a scooter. Like he was a funny, funny dude, like one of the right. funniest people I've ever known. And his his sense of humor like was in everything he made. Like he carved this like at my grandma's house when you walk in, like he's because my grandma's still still with us, ninety seven nice. years old. You nice. see, there's this like big wooden giraffe he carved. He carved, st- and the giraffe is standing next to this park bench, and it says mm-hmm. on the bench it says Giraffic Park. Stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yes, I love yeah. it. He, he, he uh, one of my so other favorites. Cool. One of my other favorites. I'm glad we're on this subject. Is he yes, carved please. this like wooden bluebird, and it, it it says, "May the bluebird of happiness fly up your nose." I like that one a lot. <laughs> um, so stuff like that. But he made guitars for the for the whole family, and he was making them. Sadly, he passed before he could get to all the kids. So he technically mm-hmm. made this guitar for, for my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I use it all the time, and that's what's on on the album. So I, I feel wow. really good about that. And you know, it wasn't like I said, like going into it, like this is going to be the guitar I use. You remember, I, I brought like every guitar I have, and we tried all of them, right. nylon strings, steel strings, and that was the one that just like sounded the best when we recorded it. So that was the guitar I ended up using for everything. That's awesome. I did not know that story. I'm glad yeah. you told it. That's super cool. There you go. Yeah. That's it. Uh-huh. All right. Um, thank you very much to our guest, Miss Holly Cook. We want to remind everybody to please. Uh, go subscribe to the Reggae Pod Clash wherever you listen to your podcasts. Give it a review. Give it a five star rating. That really helps us almost more than anything because it moves us up in the in the search algorithms when people search reggae in their podcast apps. So if you can do that and tell your friends to subscribe, um, we want to keep bringing you these amazing stories from reggae artists around the world, and we can do that with your help. And also go to rootfire.net and click on the store tab and get yourself some Reggae Pod Clash merchandise. And until the next one, I am Man Like Devin. I am Roger Rivas.